Can everybody hear me okay? Can you let me know? Hi, how you doing? Okay, what's a typical day at Red Beach? Well, actually, there's no really typical day, and I think that that's probably the, um, the main thing, is, is that we respond to whatever calls we get, whatever situations arise. So uh, we really never know in the morning when we get up what what's going to happen or where we're going to be going or what kind of patients we'll be giving them, other than the, the typical cleaning and feeding and taking care of the residents. Nice to meet you all, too. Uh, I'm going to uh, have a little bit of issue with which camera I need to be looking at. I, I have two of them here. Superb. Okay. What else would you like to know? It's great to know you're all out there. Nice to know you from Facebook and everything and chat rooms, but uh, this is really fun. Having to uh, do video from uh, our upstairs uh, guest room because our frigid temperatures have interfered with uh, connections around the rest of the house. So that's why we're sitting up here in the guest room, and uh, you may see my turkey walking around behind me. But um, we're doing the best we can. Hold up. Okay, how many patients do we currently have? Uh, right now, uh, we, we just caught up uh, four more eagles that we're going to be releasing tomorrow. And so we have a total of 22 eagles still in care. And um, generally about 200 other patients. And that includes everything from ducks to um, red-tailed hawks, uh, different types of hawks, snowy owls, other types of owls, and um, sandhill cranes, trumpeter swans, and everything in between. How many of the raptors that come to us are lead related? Uh, it really depends on the year, quite honestly. Uh, we have had um, years where we have not had much snow, and in those years we have many more lead, uh, lead cases, especially in bald eagles. And that's because uh, after hunting, the carcasses are not covered with snow, and they have more accessibility to the lead and to the, the, the carcasses that were shot with lead ammunition. And so we have many more. Um, a couple of years ago when we had a very low snow year, we actually had about a third of our patients uh, were lead poisoned, a third of the bald eagles were lead poisoned, and out of those 22 were babies. We had a um, high tornado year that year, so we had a lot of babies um, that were not in the nest. And um, um, the babies, of course, don't have much access to lead, so um, in that case, about 50% of our um, adult balls this year we haven't had as much. We have a high snow year and uh, all the carcasses were covered. So we haven't had as many as we have in the past. We have now, we have, we have roughly about 200 and that's kind of a constant number um, on any given day. everybody? Thanks, Ken. Uh, the question is, are lead-related issues getting any better? And of interest this year, and I hate to, um, I hate to uh, say yes before we know for sure, but we have not had as many cases this year. And I like to think that part of that is because we, we are doing an awful lot of lead education in our area and around the country. And um, I'm hoping that, that, you know, that maybe we're having an effect on that. So um, we have not had as many this year, but um, you know, it, it could have to do with heavy snow year. Uh, we have not had as many trumpeter swans with, uh, with lead. Um, they actually take it from the bottom of uh, 
pecans and things when they uh, when they um, eat uh, those long nuts go all the way down to the bottom of the pond and they actually um, ingest the lead pellets that are there from from fishing and and, um, and from hunting um, and lead is pervasive in our environment so that lead has maybe been there 100 150 years Okay, how many of the 22 eagles are going to be released? And the answer, gratefully, is most of them. Uh, we caught up several of them today again, and I have two that are non-releasable that would be placed in, in facilities, and those are education facilities. We just had one that went to um, the North Carolina Aquarium on Monday, and uh, they flew here and, and drove him back, so he's uh, going to be a new resident there as soon as he's out of quarantine. So um, most of those birds are going to be releasable, and we're very excited about that. Uh, we'll be doing releases within the next few weeks. Um, we're very careful to do releases only when it's not territorial. Here in Wisconsin, we're dealing with an almost saturated population, especially in the north. So we um, really can't release um, throughout the year unless we know the bird and we know the territory and we know the situation and that the bird's not going to be um, put into a territorial dispute. Uh, we don't want to lose any um, any pairs or any babies um, in the process, and unfortunately, that that could happen if we were to to just release a bird that um, you know that would maybe then go and start a territorial territorial dispute. How was your birthday? patients um, you know with uh, with bald eagles it's it's all over the map I think that you know sometimes uh, hit by cars is, is a pretty common one and that occurs a lot of times when uh, they're eating carcasses off the roads um, and they are maybe full and they can't get up and, and get moving fast enough and, and cars um, come around the curve perhaps and, uh, and hit them uh, shootings we still get an awful lot of shootings here in the north woods um, unfortunately um, lead poisoning is still well, really the major thing. Uh, some West Nile, um, other types of poisonings, uh, organophosphate poisonings, uh, um, are, are pretty severe as well. So, um, you know, it's kind of all over the map. Um, interestingly, very, very rarely would it be something natural. Uh, we have had West Nile virus, which is, you know, the only natural um, virus that we're, that we're dealing with here in the United States. So, um, it's, uh, it mostly man-caused, um, you know, like 98% are human-caused. receive patients from all of we, uh, how far away do we receive our patients we really receive patients from all over the Midwest and actually if, um, if there's a situation where they um, they need to have or OP poisoning organophosphate inhibitor and uh, that has to do with the synapses in the brain and it was used uh, quite a lot um, in, in past years but we're starting to see a resurgence again of it and it causes convulsions and uh, uh, convulsions so severe that sometimes the birds are um, uh, actually break their wings so those are the ones that I end up holding uh, and we can hold, uh, making sure that their wings are together and um, they're not going to hurt themselves. Then they have atropine and uh, it can be, uh, you know, once an hour, uh, depending on how severe the, the poisoning is and how severe the convulsions are. 
uh, and sometimes it can go on for a day, some sometimes a day and a half, and um, hopefully they live through that. And if they do, then um, you know then they're home free. But um, and hopefully they're not going to have any long-term um, damage neurologically. much risk to releasing um, eagles during the severe cold temperatures? Uh, no, there really isn't. Um, our eagles, at least here in the Northland, um, are really used to the cold and they're really prepared for that. Uh, we don't uh, keep our birds, the birds are not released. They're all um, uh, acclimated and so the only ones that are um, are released are birds that have been outdoors and that are um, well conditioned and are, are used to the cold here. Uh, we are further north. We're about three hours further north than the, the general place that we release these birds. So they're actually, um, they go to a warmer area. So to them it's a little, um, you know, it's a little warmer than when they were they've been. Um, they, the area that they're released in, and we always make sure that um, the area they're released in is very abundant. There's a lot of good food for them. And the water is open, so they have really good, good uh, really good fishing. Um, that is um, our the dam that's in the area and keeps the water a little warmer and also kind of stuns the fish as it goes over the, through the dam and then um, even the young birds have a really easy time of finding food um, at that location and that's why you'll see um, it is one of our, our prime locations for releasing birds in the wintertime which in northern Wisconsin is one of the only times that's really safe to release these birds um, the eagles because of the source control rate issue. Out of all of our releases, have any come back with another injury? Yes, absolutely. Um, we do see them occasionally come back and um, um, Sometimes it's you know it's very exciting. I mean we don't like to see them come back at all, but uh, you know to see a bird come back after eight years that had a, a broken wing um, and has been doing it, been you know living successfully um, and now an adult and, and uh, holding a territory it is very exciting. We've had probably I would say maybe five birds and all the uh, many hundreds that we that have been through here that have come back uh, with with additional injuries or, or other injuries and out of those um, I think most of those have gone back I know one um, actually arrived and, and died very shortly after but um, uh, most of them have gone back out and that's very exciting so yeah I did not answer uh, I didn't answer the one about what happens to the birds that can't be released um, I don't think at least um, uh, maybe within another question but what happens to the birds that can't be released is they they um, some of them stay with us um, as foster parents or as our education birds, but we're only allowed to have five um, that are permanent residents. So the others go to um, qualified educational facilities. And uh, we're really picky about where we send our birds, making sure that they have a, a really good facility there making sure that their food isn't going to be raptor diet which is uh, sort of a uh, ground up everything um, 
and not really good for the birds. So um, we check it out really well, make sure that they're going to be well cared for as we can and the community and the people that we're making involved. And we go to zoos and um, places around the country, um, even quite a few people actually. it's interesting to hear from these them in South America and that sort of thing. Transmitters have a purpose. Um, I think that, uh, you know, they, it depends on who, what type of transmitter you're using and, and what type of uh, program it is. don't think that they should be transmitted if you have the information or if it's available, um, you know, let's make use of, of the science that's there. But transmitters can be incredibly helpful. Um, I did uh, transmit a study of my own, actually two. One when we were doing radio transmitters, so they were not uh, the, the larger, heavier um, uh, solar transmitters. But um, it was um, it was fascinating to know that when we released our young birds, and I think people were very concerned about we get baby birds in, baby eagles in. Uh, ours are always raised by foster parents. And that is really the very best way to do it um, because they're not imprinted to humans. They're not comfortable with humans despite how they look in our arms. Uh, they really are wild and uh, they've been around eagles so they know all the behaviors all the mannerisms and and what's expected of them so um, uh, it was important for us to know how they did here's all the mannerisms and what's expected of them so um, uh, it was important for us to know how they did um, in relation to the wild birds. And we had a master's student that um, was trapping wild uh, immature eagles and putting a radio transmitter on them. And they weren't able to trap enough um, during that time period. So we used eight of our youngsters. And um, as it turned out, All eight of ours um, survived past the, uh, the drop-off point, which was about two years. The threads last about two years on, these, on uh, the transmitters before they drop off. Um, uh, you know, amazingly, all eight, eight of ours made it past that two years, and uh, they had many failures of the of the naturally wild birds um, that died. So um, ours ours were, were better than the wild guys. Sitting on the bed. Let's see where was that little. There's two of them sitting on the bed. That.
here looking at a lot of students come and see every year. We have oh. oh okay, I'm sorry. Uh, the question is how many students do we train every year and do we train students? Absolutely we do. do. Um, the number varies per year and it really varies if we have international students um, because it's a that's sort of a, um, a space issue for us and uh, uh, but we train veterinary students um, pre vets um, and a, an awful lot of uh, people that go on to be PhDs and, and professors um, uh, it's very very exciting in fact when you know I now hear back from my former students and, and uh, basically, you know, it's it's really exciting. It's it's uh, going to carry that forward. It's it's uh, a feel for us as well. and I think Barry Carey would step up to the plate if he had. Uh, we never expected that she would lay an egg. Um, we, now that winter is, is here again, um, it's, it's constantly a, a, a surprise that he continues to take care of her. Um, that's not supposed to happen in the wild world, at least as we know it. But I think that's the caveat, as we know it. Um, we make assumptions and we make kind of broad-reaching assumptions um, as humans about the wild world. And uh, these plants have been absolutely amazing in teaching us that it's not always as you think it is. And um, I've, I've learned so much myself, and I think that hopefully um, scientists are, are watching and learning as well. Um, it could be just that, you know, he's a, a very special, Larry is a very special male, and I think that those of us that, uh, that watch Eva's for Kids and are, are closely associated, at least in our part with it, um, you know, that we, we think he is. But uh, the behavior is amazing, and I think the space teaches us every single day. Little E4 and little E3, um, that's been an interesting uh, situation, too. Um, I think uh, we are seeing a, uh, a, a baby, a female, and a male, um, in the nest. And in initially, the female uh, was more aggressive and, and is more aggressive. The females tend to be more aggressive. They're bigger, after all, and uh, she's older as well. And uh, many scientists feel that the, uh, the two chicks in the nest, that, that number two is kind of a, a variable and extra, and uh, uh, it's important to keep her condition at the number one stage she needs to make it. And if that one doesn't or dies or something, then the next one is going to have to do. But um, in many little nests, both of them make it, and sometimes even three, uh, which Ray uh, showed us um, on that Venus station. But um, it, it all has to do with food supply and, uh, and, and the parents, and if they're practical parents or not. Um, we know that from ospreys, for instance, uh, watching them and, and the science behind that is that immature males, or inexperienced males, not immature males, but usually their first year, they they don't succeed. Um, the the chicks die because the male is not um, practiced enough to to be able to fish well enough to um, to keep the babies well fed. Uh, so you know it, everything is um, everything is in learning mode, and I and I I love that about science is is that you know we make kind of broad reaching statements, but everything sh is in flux and should be. Um, we should be learning. We shouldn't be making. Um, uh, you know, statements that uh, we know this for sure because it was written in a book um, 30 years ago that, um, you know, now um, we know we know different and we're learning and that's the beauty of science. Flying birds ever used as organ donors for treatable birds? No. Um, the short answer is, is that 
uh, it's, it's very, very expensive. Uh, even a lot of the surgeries that we would, we would, we're used to having on humans really aren't performed on, especially on wildlife. Uh, people don't realize, or maybe people do, that um, uh, wildlife, the wildlife rehabilitation work um, that I do and that many rehabilitators around the country do is not funded by the state or federal government. So basically, um, we're, you know, we're paying for it, um, you know, out of our own pocket and from donors um, that, that help us and support us. Uh, and that really um, eliminates any of the, the very um, extreme surgeries. First of all, animal medicine is behind human medicine anyhow, and that's not a, um, you know, any indication as to the, um, the quality of a veterinary medicine or the quality of a vet's involved, but it has to do with how much money is behind um, uh, the, uh, the research that goes into um, complicated surgeries such as heart transplants um, and things like that. Um, so no, uh, short answer is um, no, that doesn't happen. We do use blood um, um, from them and we do do transfusions uh, occasionally, but not organ transplants. That don't make it, what do we do with the bodies? Uh, the bodies, the feathers, and any, any uh, what they call pieces and parts have to be sent to the federal repository, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Federal Repository in Colorado. And there, the, uh, these are eagle parts. Um, there the parts are um, distributed to Native Americans um, that have permits to be able to have them and use them for religious purposes. is I, I love all my patients, but are there any that um, have touched me the most? And I have to say that it's the one that's in my arms at the time. I, um, and I know that that uh, sounds like a cop-out, but it's uh, absolutely the truth. They all have uh, an amazing uh, spirit, and they're all very, very different. They're very different individually as well as they are by species. Um, and I think that, you know, when you, when you work with them, it's uh, it's they're amazing, um, and um, it's hard to pick and choose. You know, sometimes uh, uh, we have uh, very unusual patients that uh, that really take our heart. Um, uh, for instance, little purple martin. Um, you know, a, a, a sort of a swallow type bird, um, but uh, very interesting and, and very intelligent. Um, and so. So no, I really don't have any favorites. It's like asking, you know, a mother about her favorite child, I guess. Depends on how they're behaving. Kushkaluk uh, is a, uh, a, how did we come to um, acquire Kushkaluk and can I tell about her? Uh, Kushkaluk is uh, from the uh, from Alaska, and I was the team leader for the um, eagle capture and health assessment back in 1989, um, and Prince William Sound uh, to capture and do health assessment on the on the eagles that were affected by uh, the uh, Valdez oil spill. And uh, she happened to be um, a bird that was nesting in a very heavily area, a heavily oiled area, Herring Bay. And I was uh, trapping eagles there that summer. I was up there the whole summer and uh, working off boats and, and uh, flying to different areas um, by float plane. And we got a call um, in uh, uh, um, July that uh, there was an eagle down on the ground on one of the islands, a very mountainous island, by the way. And so we, um, uh, they flew me out there and then a, a fisherman picked me up and took me to the island. And it was kind of straight up and down island, one of those uh, with blackberry bushes and, and thimbleberry bushes all over. And uh, she was there, she had a broken wing. Apparently she lost her, her, her chicks that year, um, her mate disappeared, um, we don't know why. But uh, she had sustained a, um, uh, a bad, bad, okay, I'm sorry, I lost my, <laughs> I lost my view there, for, uh, fracture of her wing. And, uh, and was heavily oiled because she couldn't stay out of the water because of her injury. So um, 
I basically freehand grabbed her and um, we flew her into Bellevue and uh, she did go into um, to be cleaned and, and to a veterinarian in um, Anchorage and so I finished uh, my work and then I, I asked for her to be permitted to come down to my facility so we could continue to do work on her. The thing about uh, the oil spill was is that there weren't any research birds um, that were going to be followed long term. In other words, how were they going to do in five years? I mean, maybe they look great now, but the scientist in me wanted to um, to see how were they going to do in five years? Was there uh, was there going to be kidney or liver damage that was going to show up and uh, and kill them in, in a few years? Um, and uh, so it was permitted that I, I have her on my, my permit, and she's been with me um, since 1989, since um, July of 1989. And... Uh, first came to my facility in, in Southern California when we lived there um, at Orange County Bird Trade Center and then was transferred to uh, Raptor Education Group and then moved to, to Wisconsin. And she's doing very, very well. She's, um, she's an old bird. She was probably in her 20s when, when I captured her. She was older then. And uh, she's been with me for, you know, over 20 years. So um, she's doing well. Um, for 10 years, I did do blood work on her. And uh, she did not have any long-term effects like her, her kidney or liver function. So um, she's doing well. She's still laying eggs. Um, she has a, um, a partner. Uh, she did have a male partner for um, nine years. And then they got a divorce and married. Um, what happened? But uh, she... <laughs> She made it very clear that if he was going to stay there, she was going to, he went. Uh, so, no, actually, she was with him at home. But um, anyway, <laughs> uh, so he's actually living in, in uh, Puerto Rico now. Uh, she does have a partner now, a female partner, and they lay eggs together in a common nest, and they're very happy. So um, all's well that ends well. She's doing well. She's a, the largest eagle ever captured, um, huge bird, and um, is a... Um, has survived. She's a survivor, so that's very exciting. The public can do to encourage lawmakers to um, to fund uh, the work that we do. Um, I wish there was. I think that you know, uh, unfortunately, as population grows, you know, we we think about you know our taxes and we think about things like that and and. Um, everybody wants, you know, lower taxes. We want, you know, lower, um, lower government. But uh, what people don't realize is that when things get cut, usually it's wildlife related that's cut first. And wildlife, uh, you know, animals don't vote. So um, it's not as important to people. And I think it has to become important to people. I think the voter constituents have to make it clear that, you know, um, wildlife is a, a very important part of our world. And um, it, it's, it should be an important part of, um, of what they do as well. And, uh, and to fund it would be, would be amazing. Um, I still can't believe that in this day and time that the work that we do, and we, you know, I, we did over 800 patients um, in uh, 2013, and, uh, you know, about 100 of which were bald eagles. Um, there's still, not, an, not only is there no funding, um, state or federally, but, you know, even common sense things, like um, we had a little issue with, uh, with the salmon run. Often we, we get salmon, the, the ones that die, because um, they went after they lay eggs, they die. Um, this year we were not going to be allowed to, uh, to even get the dead salmon uh, from our state. So um, it's a matter of common sense. I mean, we're taking care of uh, animals that are state and federally protected, and yet we're having to do it um, on our own, in my case, on a lot of our own retirement, as well as, you know, our donors. We are nonprofits, but, uh, uh, you know, it, it costs an awful lot of money to feed these guys and to take care of them, and we wish that we were able to uh, give them absolutely the, the best of everything. We give them the best of us, and um, we give them the very, very best we can, and uh, more than we can afford. My husband and I are not paid. We've not ever been still volunteers after all these years and um, it's just it makes sense somebody has to and um, and you know I, I couldn't I can't turn them away so um, but it does
does have to change, but it's going to take people writing and making it clear to the lawmakers that this is important to us and it's an important uh, part of our world and and it needs to be funded. doing a public service announcement on lead poisoning. We have, we do, we for other species as well. So um, I think it's important um, we do as much education as we can. Um, not only do we do educational programs, we have an education um, uh, department here at Lead Boost and uh, we um, take the birds, live birds, to uh, classrooms, and we do over 250 programs a year, um, as well as doing mm -hmm. tours here at our facility. And, uh, and th many, we have many topics, including migration and, um, uh, you know, doing owl pellets, I mean, doing all kinds of things. But one of them are is uh, about toxins. And interestingly, the young people that we talk to really seem to understand a lot better. So um, we use um, youngsters, I think, as conduits for, you know, for education and to educate the adults in their heads. And uh, it's, um, you know, I think that that's one of the most valuable things that we can do. But everything is about education here. Um, I think that nobody that brings a bird gets away without, without uh, what happened to it and um, how they can be better stewards of their land and uh, maybe prevent this in, in the future. About the West Nile virus in Utah, um, and has it been a problem in Wisconsin? Um, I have been working with that situation there, and um, I am helping um, the National Wildlife Health Center um, with samples and things from, from our birds. And so we don't know for sure, we don't have any test results back, but uh, we're certainly keeping our, um, our ear to the ground, and, uh, and we're very, very aware of West Nile. We were actually the first facility in, in Wisconsin to, recogn to recognize West Nile virus um, back in 2002 uh, in raptors. At one point it was um, thought that it was only in um, uh, crows, ravens, and jays. And interestingly, we in the north did, didn't see it in crows, ravens, and jays. We saw it in bald eagles, great horns, and red-tailed hawks. So um, we were submitting samples um, even back then and working with the CDC, and now it's, uh, it's widely accepted that it is in raptors. 